Well, thanks everybody for coming. Um, this is part of the ongoing series we're trying to do, um, is not only just featuring uh, the local contemporary art scene here and curators, but also uh, wanting to um, try to have a critical discourse around the work and the curation. So uh, every Saturday through uh, all of the Santa Fe Art Project, we've been having um, talks. And they mostly have been featured on the curators and uh, uh, <clears throat> some of the artists who are actually you know, participating in the exhibition. So the focus has largely been on the work and the concepts of the work and what have you. Um, so today I've asked Chris if he would like to lead this discussion. Um, Chris has taught at uh, Santa Fe University of Art and Design um, and I think actually both these folks worked with you there, right? <laughs> Mm -hmm. students <coughs> so um, um, yeah. Uh, yeah on different capacities yeah so um, hey so anyway uh, so I'll go ahead and introduce Chris who's going to then introduce uh, the rest of the people on the panel and these are pretty loose uh, so if you have questions or whatever uh, just you know I mean I, I think you're okay with having sort of a discussion and dialogue and people asking questions in the process right oh yes yeah, yeah this is a great small group that we can really uh, do that so that's great so take it away. Okay, thank you, David. Um, first, I want to say thanks for uh, hosting these, this kind of great series of events that really showcases um, what our community uh, brings forth when it comes to contemporary art, contemporary artists working in Santa Fe, the kind of strength of the talent, and uh, uh, what the city has to offer. Um, so that's been really uh, great, that, and I'm glad that we've all been included in that. And, then, uh, and also bringing guest, guest curators, uh, such as my wife Jennifer, who's curated the, the show and the, the adjacent galleries here, uh, women's work. Um, so I kind of feel like today, um, when, when David first approached me about talking about these exhibitions, uh, or this exhibition specifically, um, coming from a sculptor's background, uh, he mentioned maybe to discuss some of the sculpture in depth of, of what these two shows. So I began to kind of, uh, look at what what was uh, in these exhibitions, these kind of veins that kind of pull it all together. Um, there's both community ties that uh, obviously we, all three of us sitting here are um, connected through the uh, Santa Fe University of Art and Design. Um, I know Daisy, you, you both graduated from there and teach there now. So and and kind of keep everything together and keep us in check and. Um, and then Garrett just graduated this last semester, and uh, and then I also am contributing faculty there, and also Chase, who's in uh, who's not here today, um, the projection work. He's also graduated this last semester. So just on a real kind of community basis, this this room specifically, um, we all know each other, work together, uh, kind of bounce ideas off each other quite a bit, um, and it's it's a, been a really great experience working over there, and a lot of creative juice and energy. Uh, thoughtfulness that, that goes on there. So, um, but kind of beyond just the, the connections of us being all related to the university, um, when I started looking at the work, and uh, I'm, I'm a little bit biased in the kind of what I'm into is kind of found objects and uh, these kind of uh, objects that, that give us a sense of history, archaeology, uh, what's left behind, um, and, and uh, they end up being cultural artifacts, I guess, to say. Um, and, I, and I see that through, through these, both these exhibitions, especially the sculptural work, and even in the two-dimensional work. Um, and I kind of like to talk, let us kind of discuss our work and process and what drives that. And then also uh, maybe talk about some of the work in the women's work show as well, um, and, and how that all kind of relates. Um, First, I'm thinking of like ready-mades. You know, we had these objects. Uh, Duchamp kind of broke that mold for us to, to be able to use this in our um, language of art. Of these things that are ready-made, that, that are unaltered, that are kind of pure in form, taken from an out, outside context into the gallery space. And I feel like a lot of what, what is in here as well is with found objects, though they may have been uh, altered or manipulated in a way or, or taken uh, but still taken out of context as their use object, um, as we find them in kind of the daily world. Um, which, uh, speaking specifically of the ready-mades, I think what first comes to mind is maybe the work of uh, Thais Mather in the other room with the uh, women's work exhibition. Um, her drawings, both 
feed on that um, found aesthetic these kind of uh, cult cultural artifacts that she's uh, painstakingly drawn in pointillism. But then the objects that also came along with that, uh, some of the ready-mades that are in there in the uh, kind of a train uh, glass boxes, the like glass boxes. So, uh, and I kind of want to talk a, a little bit about that before we kind of launch off into our work because of, uh, she, she wasn't able to attend today. But we kind of had a little back and forth and uh, to kind of think about her process and how she, comes to view uh, the found object and its relationship into work. So I'm going to read um, uh, an excerpt of her artist statement here and then and kind of maybe point to some of that and some of our conversation. Um, so as she says, over the last year I poured myself into a line of visual research about the value of cultural artifacts, everyday objects, archaeological truisms, and the objectification of culture. Uh, when we think of the future of our own history, it sits in a space of speculation in which cultural artifacts and identities mixed and mingled become their own form of working fiction. Um, through an exploration of objects from mostly Western culture throughout history, I came to identify that men are signifiers of the creation of culture, and women are the objects of culture. So also, if you have seen that work in there, there are uh, goddess figures kind of juxtaposed with these kind of more contemporary uh, silhouettes of, of uh, female uh, form. Um, as more of an idealized kind of um, cultural betrayal. Uh, so she said, um, so as she became, uh, that the women are the objects of culture or portrayed as cultural victims, um, I began to think as women as the anonymous author, as the true creators of human culture, since we literally create it, um, although we are condemned by our own creation, while fictitious male God is praised for the creation of humanity. My thesis led me to think of my subjective experience as a lived feminist artist who is often not taken seriously or repeatedly asked to defend myself and my stance, while, like most women, I quietly create culture. Um, and so with the juxtaposition of the imagery and the drawings and the, the objects themselves, uh, she goes on to say, this installation is comprised mostly of pointless drawings, which each with thousands of microscopic dots create a hyperreal image and speak to the concept of the continual labor of creation. Sculptural pieces, uh, like those in the, the vitrines, highlight condensing eras throughout history to signify the predicament of culture. Um, so I found that really kind of engaging, and we, we kind of had a back and forth talking about this predicament of culture. Um, and then if I could just read kind of her uh, take on these objects, especially the sculptural objects, which I'm specifically talking about sculpture here. Um, because they, they, uh, they're so powerful, but so ready-made, these are, um, and I guess uh, I come from a perspective of objects seem to be uh, a placeholder of memory and experience, experience, of our own experience. And especially when we bring these ready-mades into a gallery, uh, a formal art gallery kind of scenario, suddenly we're, we're confronted with this, not as this kind of uh, their everyday use, but then to what, what does this elicit in your mind uh, as our work tends to do. So uh, in talking with her uh, briefly about it, she was thinking about, in, when speaking of condensing eras, uh, to contrast and observe what is ridiculous about our own time, and also the speculation of history. Uh, the piece with the Gucci shoes and the Zapotec head, which is uh, where that uh, small archaeological fragment was that's been gold deep, uh, which is named Plutocracy, became a postulation about the status of human beauty. Uh, when we look at images from the past, especially in, in, in uh, particular faces, it is unclear whether they are real representations or beautified by the particular myth of each era, um, these styles that kind of persist through time. It's hard to suss out the reality of history and beauty when we're consistently defining it by our own construction of what is beauty is and how we must retain it. Our obsession with the beauty myth is obviously not new or exciting, as we see from almost all human history, as Yeats described in observation of the female perspective, we must labor to be beautiful. Uh, from foot binding in China to cranial deformation in the Zapotec culture to plastic surgery and wearing heels, that can alter your spine in our present American culture, it surely looks ridiculous after the particular myth fades and should serve as a warning to the literal perils of this obsession. It is, in some way, a parody to our own ridiculous obsession with ourselves as human animals. And kind of how we, um, so, so she ended that kind of statement there, but 
as we take these kind of uh, maybe ideals of beauty beyond to the point of where they become an impediment, whether it be the high heels or the head, head elongation, but um, kind of they serve as that ornamentation. Um, the other piece which I found uh, incredibly kind of grabbing was uh, rolling, which happened to consist of the um, spinning wheel, and there was a diamond to the left side, and six hits of acid to the right. And uh, as she says, this is a light-hearted approach to the words and semiotics from different eras. How symbols and words play defining something drastically different within different periods throughout history and with different cultures is fascinating to me. We get so attached to our own ideas in our own particular time. But if you think of a simple word, rolling, how can you describe what the word meant to people in other eras? Certainly when we think about deep history, the very idea of something rolling ch changed the course of history. Um, like the wheel, the wheel revolutionized that kind of uh, aspect. But this concept of deep history is nearly impossible to understand. From how someone bathed, where they shat, their dialect is nearly impossible to understand three generations before our own. We cannot thorough or through our own search subjectivity begin to grasp it. So the use of a Spanish colonial spinning wheel, six hits of acid and a diamond, seemed like an interesting way to use the methodology of objects themselves to describe the predicament of culture. Um, so I think that she really summed it up well uh, when it comes to that. And um, so, uh, but then kind of, I guess kind of stepping into this room uh, that being these kind of pure ready-made forms that are kind of brought to our attention. But then in this space, particularly, something that I began to notice is how we use these kind of everyday objects and they were kind of modified and to bring our own context and our own understanding to them. Um, and while, say, Garrett's work, they aren't physically built of found objects, but they, they create this kind of archaeology of process. It's this, uh, these layers of meaning, these layers of paint that, that build up and obscure both what's underneath it, but then um, also kind of create this uh, narrative of history, of time, of strata, uh, like sedimentary rock. Um, and I can see a lot of that as well with uh, Daisy's piece behind uh, David over there. With, um, when we think of archaeology of process, um, you know, with, with that being specifically from your studio, uh, that, that we as artists, we, we have this kind of, uh, we have this layering and, and this, this process that leads to this um, kind of uh, the strata of history, at least within our, our personal dialogues. And, um, and that too was a, uh, a piece that you did with another artist. But, um, yeah, so would you like to talk a little bit about that and maybe? So this piece came about, I had a student who was a painter who dealt with bodies and layering of individuals and identities um, through paints and the articles of fabric and multiple things. Um, and I, in a sense, do the same thing um, with um, the layering of identities and garments and kind of the impression that gets kind of transmitted through that. Um, and, but I go about it a different way where I apply a, a material over it and then burn out the fire and then what remains is kind of a, a space that, that is held by that um, individual. Um, and I wanted to see how it kind of interacted with that in the space and kind of moving it because I'm interested in um, location as well. Um, but that was, that was, um, yeah. Um, yeah I think, um, go, go ahead. <laughs> well, I think that with a lot of, you know, you were talking that that layering of identity as with the layering of process, this layering of object and these kind of loaded objects, and especially your these other objects are, you know, very very much loaded, specifically from where you source them, um, what they're about. Um, maybe if you just could kind of like to talk about your process as a whole, because I think that's so rich in that kind of layering and these these objects that are left behind, but also maybe representative of the people that are left behind in that process. Yes, okay. so I guess a, a lot of my work kind of deals with the relationship between identities and cultures and um, what happens in that intersection between the two. So I deal a lot with or try and go down um, to Juarez and interact with the people down there and see how they kind of interact or how 
people when they're immigrating into the United States, how they're affected, and kind of the articles of clothing they left behind, or how um, people get impacted in that way. Um, so I've done a couple of works that deal around that a bit. Um, and I, what I try and do in holding on to that is um, create a space where I can try and capture these people and kind of make them more visible in a sense. So the way I go about it um, is sort of it's some sort of way of like preservation, I guess you can think of it. Um, I apply a, a, a porcelain slip, a um, ceramics material over the garments um, and that um, I'm using um, and then those, the, the porcelain would then get fired and what remains is just an imprint of what was. So in like this piece in the middle, you can kind of see the embroidery of what was of that piece. Um, if you look underneath on the other um, piece that's kind of installed against the wall, um, you can see kind of the threads that held that individual, um, like how that kind of moved. Um, and garments, I think, kind of hold the, that space for body. So as you kind of wear a garment, as you're moving through space, um, they kind of read your movement in your body and how you kind of interact with it. So I'm trying to capture that. And, yeah, but that's my process. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think it's really interesting because um, uh, if this was just the fabric, it would feel like fabric we all know we're wearing, but it seems so fragile now. Mm -hmm. So it's like it's translated into there's a tension now to it mm -hmm. that this this memory is very fragile. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting. As is, I think, any sort of content, any, any past information, right, as we keep on going through life, it kind of breaks down and kind of things get lost um, or translated and read read different ways, but yeah. In this particular piece of clothing, it was it also sourced from one of your journeys in Tawaras? No, that one, this one was actually mine. Both of these articles are actually mine. The pink one is from my confirmation, um, and uh, whatever, my confirmation. And this one was uh, an article that I would wear. Um, I was trying to figure out and resolve kind of the exploitation and mass production of articles of clothing and workers um, within areas and stuff. So this was a mass-produced um, article of clothing that was supposed to mimic traditional kind of embosses. Um, but yes, these are mine, but I do have um, other articles that, or, and then articles that I'm getting from other people um, that interact, that fall into that same area. Yeah. Very cool. And this and the soil though. The soil you, was yes, it was very it was sourced. I um I acquired that from near the border. Um, I wanted to try and place the um, the the piece in that area, but um so I went down um near um Juarez and loaded up a put up a truck with um soil that I dug up from there to there, and trying to do um pieces a little bit more of a location, geographical location. And these works specifically are, and just knowing the history of the, the work that I've seen in the time I've known here, it's very much rooted in that place, there. In, in the kind of borderline. It's kind of in this in-between. Mm -hmm. I mean, does that, do you want to speak to maybe to that in-between, yeah. kind of the precarious nature of that? I mean, I see, think your, your work ca captures that a lot as well. It's, it has this precarious kind of in-between. It's fragile, but it's there. It's Yeah, well, I think it's something that I've always kind of not not in my work, like in my work, but like also in my own life, like trying to situate where it is kind of. I well, and I think a lot of people kind of try and find that, like where is it, where is one located between the two areas. Um, so um, my parents are from Mexico, and I'm from here in the U. S. United States, but I was raised in that culture. Um, so that's kind of. I'm always trying to figure out kind of how how do I fit into that, and kind of the first part was, I guess, geographically, like where is that intersection between the two, um, trying to look at that, because it wasn't um, something that we kind of talked about a lot. It was just kind of presumed. presumed. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I don't know. It's a little, it's a little muddy. It's a little gray. I don't think it's necessarily set or stable. I know that um, like some people would, would like try and situate it, like there's kind of movement. Um, have tried to kind of give people like that space, but it's. I think it's a, I don't know, I feel like it's still constantly moving and trying to shift and kind of things. So, when, I guess, uh, also speaking to that same kind of archaeology of process, Garrett, 
I had mentioned about your paintings and this layering. Mm -hmm. Do you want to kind of give give word to that, or like the process of how these come about and how this kind of um, thickness it occurs? Do you want to start from where it extends from? Because like original idea that I had whenever I started like these series was how do I get the like sense of uh, or how do I convey the sense of a painting falling over its frame and then it evolved a lot um, to where it mainly became um, how can I eliminate the canvas entirely and produce a painting just out of paint itself without using canvases just trying to like eliminate materials and simplify things is what I was really trying to do um, but process wise it's mainly just string little bits of wood that I find here and there, scraps from the, what the studio was. And then it's plaster and it is, I guess you can kind of say it's archaeological in the same sense because I use repurposed paints more than anything just because they're mainly cheaper. Um, so I'm buying paints that people return to Lowe's Home Depot, um, the Restore, and places like that. And then I just add plaster to them to thicken them up and make them, and then mainly viscosity levels and things like that is what I play with a lot too. A lot of process is what I work with. It's also very meditative for me to do these things. They're very slow. They take time. Um, each layer, some layers can take a day to dry. A layer can take 10 minutes to dry. It just depends on the paint, like the acrylic body. Um, like. This one, for its, no, this one, for example, has concrete floor paint in it, which was a different one that I'd never used before. So a lot of mine are really more experimentations into like what I can do with the physical paint body itself as well. Um, there's some that I've already, already have plaster in them that I add more plaster to, which changes its viscosity. Um, <laughs> how do you come to the shape? Like why triangle there? Mainly how did how did how is being affected by the shape of the canvas? Like I've been pondering a new one that I want to do a new series where it's more um, I guess more topographical. Um, they seem more like maps, but it would be it would still be the natural flow of paint through these canals and these ways. Um, it's really, I get very entranced by watching paint. I, I'm, one, I'm a person who could probably go outside and watch the grass grow. Um, it, it puts me in a zen place. It helps me think. It makes me, it makes me wonder more. I feel like that's, that's why I'm more intrigued and why I do this. I think that speaks a lot to this kind of element of time, you know, of his, the, the layering and the layers of time and that kind of like watching time pass, watching the grass grow, watching the paint dry. Yeah, and I, I guess I am very young, and but I always feel like I have more time than I've ever needed. Um, grew up in the country, grew up a very frugal person, very, um, I guess, what would you call it? Oh, what would I say? It's true. Ah, uh, very country monk in life. Um, so, yeah, no, things, things were always slow for me. I like taking things slow. I like working slow. It's nice. I like being calm and collected. So the reductive process of stripping away materials to get down to the very essence of the one material that interests you the most mm -hmm. is a slow process. So yeah. you have to figure out what works and what doesn't. And I see some of that in in your work as well. This kind of passage of time, the meditation, the mark making. And there was also a reductive thought process in that as well, in terms of you know breaking a painting down to its constituent parts, like one brush stroke at a time. So I haven't removed the brush yet. I like the brush still, so I'm going to stick with it. But I can see where, you, where, where you're 
where the thought could lead. It'd be interesting too because I I just know from seeing your studio last year and seeing this kind of layering within the studio that I think would speak very well to what you you your piece in the corner Daisy this kind of like studio practice piece that that develops definitely and I think Terry's work also has that quality of layering even though hers are much more mannered I guess is the word. Um, but you can tell that there are multiple layers and multiple moments where she said, well, what about this? Or she maybe changed her mind or did So, um, you know, that kind of layering exists in a lot of the work in this show. Yeah. Yeah, anybody see that across? Across the spectrum of the two-dimensional work as well as the three-dimensional mm -hmm. work. I think that's kind of uh Sydney's process of building too, and yours. Oh yeah. And I think the further we go down the road of our history, the more we're building on those of the past. So it's kind of hard to avoid that layering and that these like previous contexts that we take out of context. Like Chase's Chase's work very much speaks to that within an our art level or history level. Um, you know, Dan Flavin over here in the corner, but it's only a representation of the Dan Flavin. Um, and it's like this flickering that's kind of so is the flickering from the actual is it from the actual piece or is it from being put through a is it a captive ray too? Um, I think that's actually through his editing process, oh, if I'm if I'm correct. Yeah. That it that it is. It's used to kind of bring the that that is the viewer's interaction is this. Um, back so it's and not forth. a function of the interface of the technology. Right. Yeah, not, not to my understanding of it. Um, but yeah, that, that very much speaks. As a found object, I mean, these are, they're found images. And I think that we see that too throughout the, the, the show. And even in uh, the photographic work like Cara Romero, like setting up the last, the last supper uh, scenario with the Indian market participants and that kind of thing. It's kind of referring back to art history and back to these. And then, um, you know, and we all use these kind of found imagery a lot differently here and there. Um, between, I think the, the yours definitely has um, a lot of political import, and has a lot of weight on it. And then, um, you know, Chase is talking about art history, and you know, you're talking about process. I think that with my kind of unfound object work, I've kind of started to. At first, it almost started as kind of these concepts kind of rolling around, and they eventually became more just a formality, just a, a formal expression of line on the wall. And that's one of my first, this is probably the second of these that become drawings from sculptural materials. And uh, I particularly enjoy how that relates to your piece here. here. It's kind of um, how sculptors draw, I guess. Um, and even yours too, Daisy. I mean, that's very drawing. You can't, is it drawerly? I don't think drawerly is a word. <laughs> um, it, it has that kind of aspect to it, this, this, um, this drawing that's happening um, with non-traditional materials. And, um, but I think my, my jumping off point was thinking about these things that get left behind, these things that, that we leave uh, kind of in the wake of our progress, um, only to be kind of dug back up, uh, maybe by future generations, um, as to be like, what is this? What was its importance? But then, uh, which which eventually led me to gilding the interior like that one of these things because it was the as the container what makes it important is what's inside, not the container itself. Um, but then specifically when they start getting into the big sheets like in the other room, they they begin to um, be more this kind of expression of just uh, light and form and shadow and this kind of like how it inter interacts with our space and our light and that kind of thing. So it becomes more of a formal exploration for me, um, kind of referencing back to art history, you know, um, instead of s uh, dropping paint onto a canvas or pouring it down down the canvas, it's kind of like uh, bending it and slapping it to the wall and then having the same kind of um, drawing. Um, that's 
that I've going on. I think the sheet panel things in there kind of referenced how fabric was painted in the 17th and 18th centuries. Sort of the planes of light, these fancy fabrics of the those gowns. I was thrilled to look at those details. It's a lot kind of the way the folds catch the light differently, mm -hmm. things like that. 19th century sergeant was really good at that. And how has your process changed, Chris, since you started the gilding? Um, I, don't, I don't know exactly how it's changed in the, well, I mean, I think in the beginning it was smaller objects and just doing the interiors, and now these bigger, flatter spaces becomes more wide open. I think I've become a little bit less particular about a lot of these. You can't see a lot of the seam lines. One of the big stuff, you know, a big piece that's been in my studio, and eventually you kind of have to let a lot go and uh, not to be so perfectionist about it and so exactly clean. But sometimes that uh, has a painter like quality to it, even in these layers of metal leaf. Kind of like what Sydney Cooper is dealing with. Even though I wouldn't call it painterly, because, but it, it kind of is. It's these, she calls her stuff painterly. Yeah, I yeah, guess she does, isn't it? It's like these layers of light reflecting at you at different kind of uh, angles. And I think we brought it up during your talk as well that I'm kind of third third in the line of that knowledge that Sydney taught Jennifer how to build and then Jennifer taught me how to build. So we're all kind of have have a a, a, lot, a lineage of education that goes through us. Represented in this show. It's yeah. <laughs> Field copy. It's a beautiful thing. Yeah, and it, it kind of becomes an obsession too. Eventually, it's like, how would this object look gilded? Eventually, it, it becomes just a curiosity, but it totally does change it and becomes kind of an alchemical process. It's still like that of casting that it came from, was to, to reproduce the object. Um, and your objects are almost, they're, they're, yeah, they're not quite reproduced, but it's like there's just a kind of a ghost of what was, um, which I think leads itself to, to kind of what you're talking about politically mm -hmm. with, um, you know, where these objects are left behind, but it's kind of the people left behind that just mm -hmm. shuffle them. Mm -hmm. So Daisy, in your process, so the actual fabric, mm -hmm. you coat it with the, the porcelain? Yes. And then when you fire it, that cloth then burns away, and so all that's left is the ceramic, or the porcelain part. Okay. Mm -hmm. There's like an underlying structure that still holds, like roots it all together and kind of carve reality, I guess. Everything else is kind of drippy and loose. <laughs> now you're specifically the, the color in it. I think we've talked briefly about that, that that came out into the, the clay material itself from the dyes and the fabric. And um, no. Well, yes, but no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I, um, I painted the the embroidery with underclay, so once you apply the porcelain slip, because it's kind of pressing onto it, um, it reads into it, it fires it, um, so it imprints onto it. Um, I did try kind of, prior to this, um, staining the thread and then just embroidering with it, but um, because of it going through the fabric, it kind of you don't get kind of that clean green because it's kind of moving through and breaking down and creating all of this dust. And so it's just it's not as good information. Yeah. Which gives it that dreamy quality, that kind of, um, as things appear in our memory, I think a lot. Because yeah. when you look at your memories, you know, or you look at your memories, when you think back to these things, they're kind of hazy, they're not all 100% there. And, it might be idealized in the way that they kind of come about in your head, but there's this kind of, there's kind of a fuzzy reality to it, to it mm -hmm. uh, there. That I very much seen that. Mm -hmm. So, any, any ideas or kind of commentary as it relates to some of what we've talked about, or?
we can continue talking about anything really. It, it, do you want to look at some of Thais's work? Yeah, we could. Sort of we could tie that all together. Yeah, we might. It, I mean, has everybody seen the exhibition? Or maybe it'd be worth walking in there to check some of that out. I would say even talking about you know objects, um, Lucretia's work also fell into some of that dealing with these kind of ready-made aesthetics, um, especially like the paper towel piece. There was the, um, one in which she drew and another one that she cut out. It kind of was very much working with that kind of found imagery and uh, things like that. And, and the pieces against the, uh, the wall in there as well, very simple, but they, they have that kind of archaeology of what, what lies beneath the surface of that plaster facade, these kind of uh, really textures, honeycomb. Hmm? It was chicken wire. Chicken wire, yeah. Okay. It's just chicken wire and plaster. Is that what they were doing? So, yeah. They're doing the same process of layering mm -hmm. and building out the form. Some materials. Yeah. And I think that might just be where we've come to in art practice that it, we can't help but kind of refer to what's, what's already happened before us, whether it be artistically or even historically. We're kind of, uh, we don't make this work in a vacuum, even though sometimes we'd like to, maybe. Yeah. Well, yeah, we can take a look around and kind of look at some of those objects a little bit more closer up. Um,